Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing, incredible individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater who strives to optimize every living ecosystem, passionate about looking after this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that dwell among it. Today's conversation is with Jim Amos. Jim is the CEO of Scout22, a PR company specializing in conscious, environmental, plant-based, and vegan capitalism. He currently writes for Forbes, but above all, he's a compassionate soul at heart and lives with 13 rescue animals in his home with his wife, Laurie. Today's conversation will be wide-spanning, but since I got introduced to Jim by Sean Stratton, who you guys might remember as the insane 100 mile athlete and Ironman competitor who runs the International Vegan Film Festival. Well, October 10th last year, so 2020, was when the Film Fest was on. Jim was one of the amazing judges on the panel and I wanted to touch on some of the highlights of the event and how he thought it went down. We also talk about living compassionately and working with conscious brands all along the theme of conscious capitalism. This was such an insightful conversation, but without further ado, here's Jim and I. Jim, welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast. How are you going today, mate? I am pretty good. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Absolute pleasure. What's been going on with your world lately? (laughs) Personally or nationally? (laughs) I mean, for some context, because this doesn't come out for a few months, Biden just got elected, so... Um, you know, nationally, it, it's a bit of a party, isn't it? You know, it, it is. Uh, it's difficult to describe to someone who doesn't live here and doesn't go through it on a daily basis, 24-7, exactly how on edge we all have been here in the States. And, you know, just those of us who do lean to the left, what is at stake or was at stake going into the election? And, you know, right up until, gosh, a day or two later, we still didn't really know whether it was all going to work out. So it wasn't like election night. We all had this huge sigh of relief and we're out in the streets here in Los Angeles partying because we were all still kind of biting our nails, wondering what was going to happen. And then it's a case of, OK, now that this guy lost, is he going to leave? <laughs> so we're still a little on edge here. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've seen all the memes come through of, you know, Donald not, Mr. Donald not admitting his defeat and kind of suing a few states and things like that. But from the things that I've read, funnily enough, when they did recount the ballots, they actually found a Trump supporter vote twice um, and he got convicted. So funny stories come out of situations like these, I guess. Yeah, Absolutely. I want to start off with a bit of an interesting thing that's been on my mind these last few months, I guess, especially with you living in LA. I'm not sure if you saw a series that came out on Netflix called Down to Earth. Uh, I don't believe I did. Okay. So it's this series with Zac Efron and Darren O'Lyon, I think their name is. And that's right. Yes. One of the episodes. Yeah. Well, one of the episodes, a great series for anyone who hasn't watched it because they talk about a lot of different solutions, climate and plant-based and a lot of different things intertwined. But one of the episodes themed was fires. And I mean, when you've got like someone like yourself living in LA and California is quite ravaged with fires all the time. I mean, what was it like around your end seeing, I get like, did you see like the red skies? Like, what was that like? Yeah, you know, as as disconcerting as the red skies were, just the amount of smoke and haze, even though the fires weren't within a, you know, a 10 mile radius of where we live up here in the San Fernando Valley, which is a little north of core Los Angeles, uh, just you know, to walk outside and smell it and, and occasionally see like little bits of, of ash coming down in our backyard, uh, yeah, no matter how long you live here, whether you just moved here, whether you've been here for 10 years like I have, or my wife who's a who's born and raised in Los Angeles, it's still scary. And, 
you think about just those trees that have been there for so long and also what happens to the animals that are there and how long everything takes to kind of recharge and, and those trees begin to grow again. And the other thing that you think about is the amount of water that's needed to put out a lot of those fires. You know, there is the, 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 the flame, um, for lack of for lack of a way that I can describe it, not being scientific, it's it's kind of like the retardant that they take up with them in the air in the planes and dump, and that's not water per se, but there's a water part of it. And mm. we have had such a drought for the last ten years that I've been here to have to use that much water on fighting the fires just exacerbates the problem with water consumption here in the state. And and. Yeah, the thing about it is, you know, California tends to be a bit of a whipping boy from that standpoint. It's kind of mm -hmm. everybody looks at it and goes, oh, thank God I don't live in California. Look at all those fires. But they had some terrible fires in like Oregon and Washington State and Nevada, you know, states that that are um, that border uh, California are very close to to it. And, you know, Oregon had even worse fires than California did. So it's not just you know, confined to the state, it's kind of everywhere in the West now. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, when I was looking at it, I think when we first got, when we first met through Sean, I think at that stage, the fires were ravaged through California back a few months ago. And I actually saw some comparisons online of them comparing it to the Australian Black Summer, which was the fires that we had through 2019 to 2020 that actually emitted, it burnt through... I think it was like 42 million acres and emitted 400 million tons of CO2. And I think that's a level that California is getting at. But like when reading studies, it's also so fascinating to see that every year they're getting more and more. Like it was something like 100 fires a year happening in California or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. And, you know, when we got them a couple of months ago, that was very early in what we consider our fire season. Yeah. So we were all not only petrified because of the scope uh, and the damage that it did, but also that it was so early in the season that we all thought, wow, what is this going to be like the next few months? I mean, I'll knock on wood to say it, it hasn't been that bad since two months ago here for a while, and we get them off and on. We saw a couple yesterday well out in the distance, but, you know, it has – the last month or so hasn't been as bad as what usually you see in late October, early November here in California. So there is some hope, and also um, – our temperature has dropped a good 20 degrees from October to November. So mm -hmm. we went through a very long patch where it was 95 to, in some cases, 115 degrees here. And that's just like lighting a match. But, you know, we're in the 60s and 70s. Today's in the 80s. But it, 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 it helps with the fires because it makes it so that it doesn't spread as quickly and ignite as much as it does if it's 115 degrees, obviously. For sure. And, you know, you'd hope that one day a solution comes. But as we're talking, I just can't help but feel like a fairy animal is going to jump on top of you. You have, you have what, 13 fairy <laughs> friends that live with you. It's, it's, it's playing through my mind as we're having this conversation. Like, wait, how many cats does he have again? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It, 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 it is funny. I they're all put away right now for this. Right. Uh, there isn't a Zoom meeting that goes by without one of them either jumping up or, you know, off to the side here, off camera, begging mm. to be picked up or showing up on the on the uh, the bookshelf behind, making a uh, a little surprise uh, walk on appearance or something. So, yeah, most of our clients understand that they may see, you know, someone come <laughs> walking across from time to time. Is it just cats and dogs? It, well, it's just it's just cats and dogs. Though outside, we do feed two squirrels that hang around our backyard, and we also have this family of raccoons that helps themselves to the cat food out back every once in a while in the middle of the night. So uh, that's always a treat to look out and see these enormous raccoons <laughs> like yeah. sitting up on, on the bench that we have. But 
Yeah, we um, they were all rescues, uh, not yeah. the raccoons, uh, but uh, <laughs> the, cats, the cats and dogs. They're, they're all rescues. And, you know, a couple of them just live outside because they've always lived outside in our backyard. But we rescued, I think, five of them from a pretty rundown factory in downtown Los Angeles. Somebody who we knew called and said, look, we've got this, with this huge infestation of cats. We know you rescue them. Do you want to come and get them and then find homes for them? So we did that. We found homes for a couple of them and the rest of them are here. And then, you know, we, we, we hear about, you know, a, a, somebody needing to, um, to uh, foster a litter. And then we did that and couldn't quite give them up again. So they became part of the household. household. So, you know, we, they, they generally generally get along, Tom, but uh, yeah. Yeah, there's always the, the two groups of cats, you know, kind of have to hold them back sometimes to make sure they don't uh, take a swing at each other. My gosh. So you've got these 13 animals adopted and rescued and you've got a few that come by and help themselves to your treats. What, it, like, what conversations, or it would almost be frustrating for you, I would imagine, to see someone purchase a pet. Like, do you have those conversations often with like the whole adopt, don't shop kind of mentality? We do. And a lot of times we have to just bite our tongue, uh, you know, because we'll see uh, a, a, a cute dog or something and, you know, we'll talk to the owner just out of, you know, just, out, you know, just being nice, telling them how much we, we love their dog and how cute he or she is. And they'll say, oh yeah, I got them from a breeder in Sherman Oaks and, you know, you'd love to say, you know, gee, can't you rescue, you know, one? And then the, the one of the great things that California did is it did away with the pet store mm. uh, animals. Yeah. So, you know, we don't have to go into the mall and see pet stores like there was when when I was a kid growing up, uh, and and know what goes on at those at those places. So, but you know, even when somebody says that they got their pet from a breeder, it's you know. It, it, it does make us feel like there are a lot of shelter pets who are wonderful pets that, you know, probably won't have a home, uh, you know, and, and you know, God knows what will the, happen to them. Yeah. Well, you know, in the U.S. alone, which is a fact I learned, I think, the other week, 100 million pets actually have to get euthanized and put down across the U.S. in shelters alone. So this isn't even including the strays that come along. So even like here, we don't have pet shots either. Either I, As a kid growing up, I did see them in shops and now it's just gone, which fantastic. And, you know, thank God they're illegal, but breeders have very similar systems. So when I even come across friends or colleagues that are like, yeah, I'm going to buy this dog. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I just, you, you kind of don't know what to say because we've got two cats. One, we actually got from a breeder because they forgot to neuter their cat. And then they had a bunch of litter that they were going to send to a shelter, which God knows what's going to happen in that shelter. And then other one we rescued. But just a friendly reminder to anyone listening to this conversation, Jim can attest that 13 animals is not a lot, but also adopting them is such a compassionate thing to do, but also a way for you to do your little part to keep the heartbreak when you go to a street and you see a cat or a dog, skinny, injured, um, lacking a home and it kind of should be where your mentality is at in terms of adopting and things like that. Yeah. And, and one thing that we can swear by, and we also have heard from so many of our, our friends uh, who have um, shelter pets is that you won't find a more loving animal uh, and, and, and a lovable animal than one that was in a shelter. Uh, they're so happy to have a home and, you know, you may or may not get that with a bred dog or, or, or a cat, but boy, I tell you, every one of the pets that Lori and I have who are, um, who are shelter, uh, pets are just so happy to be here and just give you unconditional love. Mm, that's a beautiful way to to kind of change gears here because uh, a lot of what you, well, your wife founded Scout 22 where you're the CEO and head of PR. 
can you give us a bit of a backstory to how Scout 22 came to be and what you guys do over there? Sure. Um, my, my wife and partner, Lori, and I um, were basically in the corporate world, not together apart. She worked with all of the, with many of the major marketing agencies. So she had big brand experience. She worked on Honda and, and, and ADP. And, you know, even back in the day, like a, you know, a, a fast food type of, mm. um, type of account as well. So she's had big brand experience. And about six or seven years ago, she realized that what she was doing wasn't leaving a positive imprint on the planet. And she wanted to work with companies who were doing that. She looked at companies like a Patagonia. She looked at companies uh, that really wanted to be a force for good in the world. And she wanted to work with them and take her big agency experience and put it to use in that regard. And so she started up Scout 22. And I spent many years with one of the big Hollywood movie studios of all places. Uh, and when, and, and I was getting to the point, Tom, where I was kind of getting tired of doing the same thing because I had done it for so long. You know, you can... Mm -hmm. Only yeah, <laughs> all, so many of the same types of movies the same way as you did from when you first got out of college. So, you know, when we met, um, I, I saw what she wanted to do and what she had been doing with Scout 22. And for me, it, it just clicked. For me, it was, yeah, you know what? I haven't really done anything that I'm overly proud of in my career, other than just having a career and working my way up to a certain level. But, you know, I, I hadn't thought to myself, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the good that I brought by doing that. And so I decided to come on board. And now we work with vegan plant-based conscious capitalist companies. We work with a recycling company. You know, like I said, anyone who is, is, is just looking to be a force for good in the world. Uh, and because we're pretty lean, we don't have hundreds of clients, we can kind of pick and choose who we want to uh, be with. And that gives us great flexibility to work with some amazing companies, both past and present. And that's really made it rewarding. And we see, you know, that, that the fruit of our labor is beneficial to the planet in a, in a real mm -hmm. tangible way. It may be a small way, but it's it, it's a tangible way. I'm curious to know, you know, when we're talking these big brand companies, like I think a big obstacle, especially when you're looking at small businesses that don't want to make ethical decisions because they feel like it would really negatively impact their profit margins. Do you find that when you've got this conscious forward thinking and environmentally responsible company, like does that negatively affect their profit margins? Not if it's done right. Actually, it could be the other, it's actually the other way around where I think consumers these days are looking for brands that reflect their own beliefs. And I think there's a lot of people out there who you know, look at a Patagonia and, and they're not a client. So I, I'm not, I'm not talking <laughs> Patagonia, but you know, they realize that, you know, so much, so many of their profits go back into helping people, helping the planet that I think this ethical consumerism I, I, it, that has been growing over the past couple of years, I think has really taken a big jump during COVID because People are being very careful about where they want to spend their money and, and more importantly, who they want to spend their money with. And I think that information, the companies that are doing good for the planet uh, is coming out because of social media more and more. Uh, and, you know, we, we've, we've seen it all around. And I think that that's really a great opportunity for these companies to expand their consumer base and, and really grow their revenue. Mm. And then thinking about like having it almost being a common knowledge, like if you're in marketing or whatever, you see that consumers are slowly making that shift to want to vote with their dollar in an ethical and compassionate way. What do you think would be the first initial steps for a company that might not be so ethical, 
to kind of turn that around and have, I guess, an ethical baseline? And what are some things that a company has to think about? Well, I think that they can, you, you, I, I think it gets a little unwieldy if you try to do too much too quickly, you know, so maybe you kind of look at one thing, whether it's the environment and is there a organization that you really uh, feel like you, your company aligns well with and, you know, whether that is helping the rainforest, whether that's just helping climate change, um, you know, just do just start off doing good in some form or fashion. Uh, we have clients um, like Milkadamia, for example, which is a macadamia nut, nut milk company who- Smart name, great, love it. I, I know, I know, and their product's great. Sorry, that's all I'll hawk today, that's it. Uh, <laughs> but but um, they are very focused on regenerative farming, which is keeping uh, carbon in the soil and not letting it uh, go out into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And they're also very big on their products not being, not having palm oil. And I think we're starting over the past year to see the real damages of palm oil farming in Southeast Asia yeah. and palm oil production and the toll that it's taken, not only on the environment there, but also the indigenous people who made their living for centuries on the forests, the rainforests there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for companies who are looking to do a toe dip into, you know, doing something good for the planet, look to see what you can get behind. Look to see what resonates with you. And, you know, and then just share what you're doing about it because it's the transparency is also very important because it's one thing to say we support trees. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to say how we support trees. You know, we plant a hundred trees for every hundred dollars spent or something, you know, but yep. you have to be transparent and show people why you want to be believed and why this is important to you. Perfect. Do you like, this is something that I found really fascinating. I love these dinner table conversations as well. When you're looking at a company and they say, you know, let's use the example of for every hundred dollars you spend here, we'll plant a hundred trees. And then like there has to be some sort of follow-up or I guess almost like a supervision of is this getting done? And a lot of that could be certification. So in Australia and New Zealand, we have something called a B Corp, which is like this oh, certification. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if you guys have that as well. We do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. certified B Corp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So perfect. So do you think it would be almost important for every company that's sort of doing something that's environmental to be supervised by some sort of accreditation of some sort? You know, I do, but I don't want that to dissuade companies from doing a small part because certified yeah. B Corps, there's a lot of uh, things that you have to do to become a certified B Corp company. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, I don't want them to see this and get overwhelmed and say, oh, gee, I don't want to do it because there's no way we're going to be able to meet all of those standards and requirements. So, but, you know, I think that this is a great way for companies to use their social media and their websites to say, here's, here's pictures of what we did in uh, the rainforest in Brazil. Um, here's, here's our little plot. Uh, here is, you know, here, here we are with the, uh, the people who, who plant the trees in Southeast Asia. Uh, it, that social media is the best tool for transparency that you get. Yeah. Well, social media is definitely the way that a lot of companies can communicate with their, I guess, consumer based and whatnot. And another thing I wanted to touch on actually, which is something that I also love talking about with guests is the roles that governments have to play. I'm not sure if you've thought about how, so let's look at the fossil fuel industry, for example, you've got, and even like factory farming, a lot of the times these farms are only making due because they're getting heavily subsidized by the government. Otherwise there'd be tens of thousands per farm in debt every year. Do you think right. there's some sort of like role, a government or some sort of systematic approach that we can adopt that could maybe reward a, a company that's making really ethical business decisions more than just their profit margins, which might not all the be, always be the case because it is in a lot, of a lot of cases more expensive to be ethical? 
Yeah, I, I, I definitely do. And it's something we think about a lot. And when we see someone like uh, Justin Trudeau up in Canada, mm-hmm. uh, putting aside, I think it was 100 million, but I'm not positive on that to advance plant based. Yeah, protein. 100 mil, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, that's something that obviously we haven't seen in this country over the last four years. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, we see the battles that are going on in the EU about even calling plant-based burgers burgers. I mean, yeah. they almost had to call them plant-based discs. I mean, that's how much <laughs> government pushback there is yeah. in favor of the meat and dairy industry. And, you know, we, we, we followed the dairy industry here and the amount of subsidies to dairy farmers uh, is staggering. And, you know, a lot of people in this country, when they hear the term dairy farmers, think of, you know, a family farm somewhere in Wisconsin. Those are the minority because most of your dairy that you get comes from these huge mega farms that are either, you know, uh, main producers of the the uh, main dairy companies or run by the dairy companies themselves. So, you know, to to see that is 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 disconcerting, and to try to have the dairy industry rationalize that as saying we're keeping you know mom and pop dairies in business to a small extent, yes, but mostly you're keeping you know the the, the main dairy companies in business. And, and viable. And, you know, even with that, in 2018, the last year, we've had um, uh, stats for the dairy industry, and they lost 1.2 billion, I believe, even with the subsidies. So, you know, dairy is taking a hit. Uh, and, you know, it, plant-based dairy is, is a good percentage of, uh, is a good reason for why it's taking a hit because the percentage of Americans who have a plant-based milk in their fridge is, is growing. And I, I thought I saw 40% the other day, 40% of Americans have a plant-based uh, milk in their fridge. And, you know, when you think about it, if, you know, the plant-based meat, meat industry isn't at that level yet, but if you think of what kind of, you know, white space is available yeah. there if they get to 40 percent if they just follow dairies you know plant-based dairies lead it's just a tremendous amount of money to be made uh and a lot of good that goes along with that that uh, money making for sure i mean look at all the plant-based companies that are making tremendous leaps and bounds like let's look at impossible impossible burgers who had like a i think they had a pr lawsuit just by calling themselves a burger like it was just insanity and you know, you got beyond me, you've got Oatly, all these companies absolutely coming out and they don't have any form of government subsidy yet. They're somehow making, I don't know how many, how much in freaking dollar form of profit. And it's like, what is possible in terms of like helping them create a new technology if, if the government could subsidize them is just, it's almost boundless and limitless in terms of possibility. But on the PR side of things, what's something that you think the plant-based meat world needs to get better at? Uh, I think that they need to get a little better on uh, allaying the fears of people who don't think that it's going to taste like the burger that they are used to have. I think that if you looked at plant-based burgers even as recently as five or six years ago, it was the black bean burger and the mm-hmm. veg burger that really didn't even pawn themselves off as tasting like burgers, you know, a hamburger. So, you know, you, you want to try to expand to the meat eaters to say, okay, even if you're not going to totally switch to the impossible or beyond or any of the others uncut, um, do it one time a week. Try it. And because you're going to find that the the taste and texture are both pretty darn similar to what you're eating right now. It's healthier. It's healthier for the animals, obviously, and it's healthier for the planet. Uh, I think that the taste part of it, I think, is a big thing. And I think that they really need to focus, at least here in the States, on the middle of the country, because these are the majority of the meat eaters. 
And these are the ones who you're going to expand the market with by getting them to try it. The people who eat meat on a regular basis in, you know, places like Kansas and, and North mm-hmm. Dakota, you know, who haven't really tried beyond or impossible, but you know, there's a whole enormous part of the country here that doesn't eat plant-based and that's where your growth is going to come from. Where like, is this in the form of like, well, you, you said social media before, and that's something companies need to do to kind of uh, make themselves known as being, I guess, in friendly. Is this meaning more like almost it'd just be efficient to just see like a video of a meat eater eating an impossible burger all over social media? Like in terms of their marketing ploy, is there anything you think that they're doing really well at on the on the flip side of that question? Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I, 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 I do. I, I think that... I think they did an excellent job with their low hanging fruit, meaning for us in California and the Northeast and places where, you know, like in Austin, Texas, where they were waiting for something that replicated the taste of what they grew up with. And I think that they've done a good job at getting the message out there. Uh, I do think that a lot of plant-based companies need to focus more on just straight ahead mainstream marketing. And we saw that with Oatly here in the States. They Mm -hmm. had a huge outdoor campaign, uh, billboard campaign, just bus shelters um, for several months. I think it was last year. Honestly, in Los Angeles, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing an Oatly ad. And even in, in mainstream magazines and newspapers, you saw it as well. And they saw their profits just soar after that mm. well um you know i'm curious to know on the on the marketing side as well what you think of this whole like not marketing a product as vegan but just saying like burger and then somewhere on the little bottom you've got a little label that says like vegan or plant-based like almost hindering or hiding the fact that it is plant-based what do you think of that in terms of the market approach yeah, you know, I, I, I understand that and I get it. Um, it it's just you're not going to fool too many people because I think they're going to stumble on the fact that it's plant based. So you might as well say that it's plant based, but just push the fact that it's a taste and texture you remember. And <clears throat> for us uh, in, in the industry, I think that there is a, um, a real debate on whether you on whether you label something vegan or whether you label it plant based. And I think it's just a perception in consumers' minds, especially in places that haven't adopted plant-based to call something vegan. Because I think there may be a little bit of a, oh, it's vegan? I don't, I don't want to try that. Mm-hmm. You know, right. plant-based may be a little bit more, uh, you know, soothing and amenable to them to try. So there, there is a debate that rages uh, in, in, in the marketing industry uh, about whether to call something vegan or plant-based. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess in my mind, as, as you were talking, I'm kind of like, if, if vegan product would be like one of those ones that have like compostable packaging, no plastic inside, and then plant-based would be the ones that are just the burger or whatever it is with like the plastic and doesn't have that whole ethical circle that generally vegans are because it's more of a lifestyle thing. Um, do you think having like these biodegradable plastics or these pineapple skins or whatever they use to package things nowadays. Do you think that's a smart marketing move? Yeah, I definitely do. Because you know what, whether you're a plant-based company or not a plant-based company, um, sustainability is big. And mm. and you're finding a lot of uh, non-plant-based companies really focusing on the sustainability of their packaging. Uh, and so if you're, like you said, you know, putting out a product for a vegan or plant-based lifestyle, then, you know, a commitment to sustainability, I think is, is really important for your consumers who are probably looking to you for that. Mm, For sure. And you know, what's really uh, fascinating, I guess, about this conversation about I'll talk is, you know, this podcast is very much about climate change sustainability, but I've got Mr. Jim, a marketing guru on here, because I think, as a, as a society and as a planet, we need different facets of everyone doing everything in a sustainable and an ethical way. So in the marketing world, so let's, let's go towards like, I'm 
I'm wanting to get into marketing or PR or something like that. So I can represent, you know, ethical plant-based vegan companies so I can further that movement and help us kind of create that clean future. What's like the best piece of marketing or PR advice that you've ever gotten or can give? Uh, wow, that's uh, <laughs> take your time, take your time, and that could be multiples. I mean, yeah, come <laughs> for a second here. Um, you know, I think that it goes back to the word I used earlier, and that is transparency. You know, if you really want to be a part of doing good for the planet from a marketing standpoint. Mm-hmm. I, if, if you do something that isn't aligned with that, people see through you and it'll really come out when you try to, uh, you know, try to, try to con vegans or plant-based into buying products if you're not that as, as well. And that's one of the things that we really do pride ourselves on at, at, at Scout 22. And that is that, you know, we don't have all these plant-based clients and then have Taco Bell, you know, we, so, you know, we, we, we're both in, you know, corporate America and we got out of this because of exactly the example that you said, because we wanted to do th- something that was positive for the planet, leave, leave a positive imprint. And so, you know, if, if you want to do that, it's difficult to be, pardon the phrase, half pregnant where, you yeah. know, you're either doing it or you're not. So it's hard to call yourself a plant-based marketing agency if you're also, you know, selling leather goods yeah and and like obviously in the future as well i mean i can get you to attest to it but i'm set i'm thinking that there's going to be more of a market need to represent these social and ethical companies in the coming years true yeah i would say so i think it's definitely working in that vein and and definitely going that way so i don't think the trend is going to go back anytime soon and i think that COVID is only kind of helped it in a strange way go forward as well because people are becoming more conscious of what they put in their bodies, what they use, how much they use, uh, you know, as far as, as, as what kind of packaging, you know, and, and, you know, sustainable packaging has been a, uh, has been a huge plus for the food industry. Because when you think of all of the food waste and all of the plastic waste that's been going on, the fact that so many companies have switched to a little bit more sustainable um, uh, packaging and wrapping and and, and shipping, I, I think that like you said, is only going to go forward from here on out. It's going to be even more of a marketing focus than it is now. I wonder on the topic of plastic, which is kind of irrelevant, what we were just talking about, but if like, I'm not sure if you guys have had something similar, but in say Tasmania, which is the, the lowest kind of part of Australia, kind of not, um, they had banned in my knowledge, single use plastics in terms of bags, uh, forks, straws, that kind of stuff. Victoria at the moment has banned plastic bags. Do you think that when, and this is just an interesting thought provoking question, I guess, when something like single use plastics in terms of bags, straws, forks, spoons, cups, all your general crap that you get that you don't really need. Is there a way that we can market that or have some sort of PR with it as a global collective to make sure that snowballs through a slippery slope and just, I guess, not only bans it, but helps people understand why we're banning it. Yeah, I think that it's already happening. I, I, I do. I think that you're finding an awful lot of companies who wouldn't even have thought about sustainable packaging and, you know, straws and, and wrap and everything, whether they're plant-based or not, have really switched to it. So I, I think it's already happening and it's it, it's like a snowball where instead of, oh, you're the company who provides sustainable packaging, it's more of, oh, you're the company that's still, you know, handing out paper, uh, you know, straws with the paper wrapping on it. Are you serious? So it's more of an anomaly that you don't do it than you do do it. Oh, that's, that's bloody great. Cause I, I still come across people who don't even know why to say no to straws and, and you know, that the straws or paper straws need a freaking better PR team. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Well, if you ever run into anybody, give them our name. And we'll, yeah. uh, we'll <laughs> um, look, let's switch gears. We met through a uh, mutual friend, Sean Stratton, 
this beast of an athlete, which I think was episode 70. I think it was 70. Um, everyone would know him as the person who freakishly ran a hundred miles, but also runs the vegan film fest. Um, so you were a judge on the international vegan film fest that just passed in October. How did that come about? You know, it's funny when, when I, I knew I was going to be on, I knew that was a question that you were going to ask me. And so I racked my brain to figure out how Sean and I <laughs> got introduced and to, for the life of me, Tom, I don't remember. How is that for a terrible answer wow. for you? Really? Somehow we got, uh, somehow we got introduced and, you know, it, it was one of those things where I knew and I had heard a lot of stories about people um, going vegan because of vegan films. They watched Forks Over Knives. They watched, you know, a, a lot of these great mm -hmm. films with the vegan theme. And when I heard about the festival, I, I, th I thought it was, I thought it was a great way of really kind of taking that to the next step and not just waiting around for something to come on Netflix in that vein, but also let's do a shout out to all these vegan filmmakers and let's put everything in one festival and present it and see what we come up with. And, um, you know, I, I, when I talked to Sean, I said, you know, look, I, we'll do some PR for the festival. And, mm -hmm. and he knew my time at Sony pictures. So he said, do you want to be a judge? And I'm like, sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I'll be honest, the first year, which I think was 2018, I honestly did not know what to expect. I didn't know if we were going to get these, you know, forks or knives, knives type of things, or whether it was just some guy with a handheld uh, camera yeah. making a, uh, you know, making a, a six minute video. Uh, and one of the great things about the festival to me is that you have the full length films, but you also have short films. And we even had PSAs this year. So you get the full range uh, and, and you also get not only vegan specific movies, but also movies about animal welfare, about the environment. Uh, so you see, and, and because it's international, they come from all around the world. So you see the, the impact that veganism has and the respect for the planet from not only your own country, but you know, Iran, Germany, I mean, the one, the one this year was from Germany, it was Butenland. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just, you know, the, the scope of the films, I think was the thing that really impressed me in 2018. And then the one that won best film that year was 73 Cows from Alex Lockwood. And that went on to win the BAFTA for best short film. And yeah, that was incredibly really? satisfying to know that that's, started out really on our, you know, on our little film festival. That was 2018 that he won that? Uh, he won the 2019 BAFTAs uh, for best British short film. That's amazing because Alex Lockwood, I did see some of his films as well on this year. So he's yes. clearly just creates them all the time. That's his thing. Yes. And uh, yeah, one of the films that he, um, he submitted this year and it won for, I think it won for best environmental film was, uh, a movie about uh, George Mambio, who is the British uh, environmentalist, yeah. journalist. You like that one? I, I, I was so happy. Actually, I actually asked to do the intro for the virtual film festival on that because I enjoyed it so much. And I, I love the fact that it wasn't one of these things where he had to have a blow horn and he had to have 10,000 people and showing scenes of animal cruelty. Monbio did it really through just thoughtful uh, communication and brought his message to so many people in a way that felt like you could be a part of it. And, and it was, it was, a wonderful film. And again, this year, the, the, the quality of the movies are, are really outstanding. So what were some of your favorites? Uh, well, Bootenland, I thought was, I thought was terrific. Um, you know, it was about, if, if people don't know what it is, it's about a German farmer who had been, I think it was a goat farmer and, um, nah, he, he was a dairy, dairy cow farmer. He's like, he okay. His, yeah. And then what happened was he ended up taking on <laughs> a better way to put retirement cows and yeah. kind of gave them a nice end or second half of their life. Uh, and, you know, just the impact that it had on him. And 
it was beautifully shot and beautifully told. And it's everything a movie should be. It just happened to be vegan. You know, it just happened to be about animal welfare. And those, those are the films you like to reward because they're great standalone movies that also are about an important subject matter. Um, you know, I, I, I also loved uh, Wild Hearts about the um, Alberta wild horses. And that was, that was I, I thought, an, an excellent film. Um, the other one that I really liked, and it didn't get rewarded, but is a wonderful film, if people can see it, is one called Kindred Creatures. And it's all about uh, animal sanctuaries and the people who work with them. And, yeah, again, it's, it's just a story well told. Mm. Well, you know, I'll try to leave a few of these if I can find them online in the show notes, but I'll leave the names and stuff. I'm sure you can muster them up somewhere, but Wunderland was a really good one. I think it went for like about, about an hour, but it was, it was a tearjerker that one. Cause you see, you know, not to spoil it too much, but you see like a few sick cows come in and they have to, you know, bring in the vet. And I, I think they had to euthanize one at one stage. Cause he just had a, like a broken leg and he just couldn't move. And it's, it's a really sad one, but the films are done so well, but it's also cool to have these films that aren't really, I guess, in, in quote, um, mainstream as big as like Forks Over Knives or Game Changers or ones like these, but that are like local and seeing how this impacts the community. Um, I, I love heaps of them. I mean, even Invisible was a great one about these two female investigators going to pig farms and you get to see those kind of operations. And, you know, films like that kind of just make you think how far an individual really goes to try to get animal liberation, but also seeing, oh, crap, this is in today's society illegal. And it almost seems that little film like a, a bit of dystopia. Like how, like how, how is this, how is this legal? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, last year we had a couple of, of excellent films. One of them, the, the one that won best film <clears throat> was about the rodeo industry. And how, you know, how antiquated that is here in 2020. And, you know, we, we as, as animal lovers like to look around at things that happen like in bullfighting in Spain and say, how can that still be a part of their culture? I mean, it's the 21st century. And then all we have to do is just look to the West and see what happens to these animals in the rodeo and think, you know what, it happens here too. And we're just ignoring it. And I think that that's one of the reasons why the judges uh, liked that film and rewarded it last year was because of the fact that, you know, it's easy for us to point fingers elsewhere, but you know, the thing it's still going, on here and 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 north of the border as well mm, for sure do you know if the festival's running next year yes it will oh it is awesome so you know i'm assuming because this was the first time it was digital due to covid and so i was really i had my fingers crossed to do that magical uh, i guess spell to hope that it was successful because you know obviously sean is you know he's done lots of things and this is almost like a love out of his heart little thing and it's something that's missing in the world a little film fest like everything else is a film festival why not veganism yeah i you know I, he could speak to you know as far as monetarily financially whether oh. it was a success or not but you know we we had um miyoko shinner and uh, from miyoko's creamery yeah. and also dale vince from ecotricity in the forest green rovers as the judges so um present company excluded it's a pretty really Im impressive judges panel and we had films from all around the world again and and each year from 18 to 19 to 20 the quality of those films and the diversity of the films uh has has just expanded and so it really bodes well for the future of the festival Mm, for sure. Um, how did you find, you know, working as like the PR for a vegan, vegan film festival? Did you find it easier because it is something unique? Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of people who who were kind of hooked on it from 2018 and were waiting for what happened this year. And and also, I think that we had the advantage of being virtual this year. Mm hmm. Uh, in an odd way, you know, because we couldn't all congregate, it worked a little bit in our favor because we weren't just resigned to a movie theater in Ottawa for the fest. You know, it was available to everybody and you could pick your own group of films, your own slate of films to watch. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know what's going to happen from that regard in 2021. I, I don't know if 
Sean even knows now whether that's going to continue to be virtual or not. But I, I think that really opened up the possibility of so many more people, not only here in the States or in Canada, but also around the world watching it. Mm. Well, were you doing the marketing last year in 2018 as well for it? Well, we just handled the PR. Yeah. Just the PR, right. Okay. So did you find that wasn't really much different than being this year virtual and last year in person? That was very much similar or did you find it quite distinct? Uh, no, like I said, the virtual component of it really did kind of make it uh, interesting because you can offer people the opportunity to see it uh, and and give them a free view and really see those films rather than just kind of hearing about them or seeing who got a- awarded um, the, the prizes so they can see for themselves. So it really did expand our audience. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, um, look, on the tail end of the episode, is there anything that we maybe haven't touched on or something that you're particularly passionate about or enthused about that you'd love to share? You know, I just love where everything's going as far as the new plant-based companies and also the investment in those companies as well. You know, we had talked earlier about governmental subsidies for plant-based and vegan companies, but you're seeing investment in new vegan companies from VCs, from major comp- major consumer packaged goods companies. Uh, you know, a lot of the big names are coming into the space. And that's just going to fuel the growth of plant-based meat, plant-based dairy. And also we're looking at so many more new areas, new many, so many new sectors within plant-based, meaning new ingredients, uh, vegan textiles. Uh, you know, there's just so much of a white space out there and so many other like comfort foods are becoming so big, especially with everybody hunkering down during COVID that that's going to be a real force going forward as well. So there's just a, a, a wide range of, of open possibilities for this, this sector. And it's great to be a part of it. And just, you know, we, we love the fact that every day there's one person who's not eating meat, who's eating plant-based or not drinking dairy and who's drinking plant-based. And we just, you know, love that there's a positive imprint that we're putting on the planet. That's amazing. I, I love that you ended it with positivity because the next question I was going to actually ask is, is um, what's something that you're really excited about? And that could be personally, that could be nationally, that can be within Scout 22. Do you have anything to say different to what you just said? Because it was pretty positive and exciting. Well, you know, we started off this conversation talking about, you know, (laughs) the political scene here. Yeah. Um, You know, I think that so many of us in this country are feeling so much better about the future of the planet because of who's going to take over in January uh, and uh, the uh, administration's commitment to doing everything they can for the planet and our environment. And I think that like I said, we're excited about that. We we all, as I mentioned earlier, breathe the collective sigh of relief when that happened. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And I can't wait to see what's happened and how it'll affect the Australian political system either because, you know, as soon as, um, you know, he took the lead and Biden kind of got that, we had our PM, Scott, good old ScoMo, come out and say, um, you know, that we're going to rethink our political and environmental uh, policies as well because of that. So I think the global, even though it's a national, um, you know, American thing that's happening in election, I think it'll really have a global impact in terms of policies. And because you're such a, I guess, big nation, it'll have a large imprint and you got to kind of, you got to cast away a little bit and it hasn't been, I mean, you know, I can't give my political opinion, but it hasn't been like that over the past four years. So I'm excited for you guys and how that'll affect the rest of the world as well. Um, but if we wanted to connect with you or Scout22, where's the best places we can go? Uh, you can go to scout22.com. You can email me at jim at scout22.com uh, and uh, yeah, I will write you back. Awesome. Perfect. And I'll leave that in the show notes in case you don't know how to spell Jim. 
Um, look, it, it was an absolute pleasure to have this conversation and thank you so much for all you do for the planet. And even though, of course, you get the monetary award, rewards of representing these ethical and conscious companies, it's nice to have someone switched on really helping, you know, businesses take the lead and, and offer solutions in a planet that's been quite devastatingly hurt by us, I guess, in a lot of ways. And thank you for, you know, rescuing and adopting animals as well. It really makes a difference. And for all the coffee table conversations you've had, you know, and the seeds that you've planted in people, whether that's through eating plant-based or, you know, the whole adopt, don't shop, you know, as a fellow human and a plant eater, I thank you for that. And I appreciate so much of your time that you've spent sharing the good old Jim goodness with us. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Tom. I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Hi there. Welcome to the end of the episode. Thank you for lending me your ears and your mind the whole way through. Thank you to Jim once again for coming on the show and sharing your insight and wisdom. If you want to connect with him, as always, the link is in the show notes and connect with us in the show notes as well. If you want to help out, the best way to do so is to leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, but also sharing this with your friends, your family, your colleague members, all of all of that good stuff. But that is all from me today. I will see you guys next week for the next episode. Stay happy. Eat plants. Peace.